there's two lectures today. One is on the complications of um, biologicals that are advertised on TV. And the other is on um, ED gizmos and gadgets that I have to do. <coughs> if it's OK with you, I'd like to flip them around. And the reason is, <coughs> by the time that second lecture comes around, after the break, on the last day, um, there won't be this many people. Um, so this, I think, is, is a better uh, lecture for the gang um, because it's got some fun things in it and it's got some really worthwhile things to talk about. So if it's okay with you guys, we'll flip them around. We'll do the ED gizmos and gadgets <coughs> at this time. Um, the, if, you, if you flip to the page, the first thing you see there is a, a little square with a, uh, a 20 on it and it looks like it's hooked up to a syringe and a needle. This is a really awesome little device. It's called a, um, a compass manometer. And what it is, it's, it's a pressure transducer. And you can hook it up to things. And the nice thing about it is, to calibrate it, there's a little, if you look, there's a little kind of dark spot on the right side of this thing. You push that, and it automatically calibrates. So it's done. You're already calibrated. You fill it with a little bit of whatever solution you're using. And it's done. So if you want to hook it up to a CVP, you can hook it up to a CVP to measure your central venous pressure. It's designed for people who also don't have an ultrasound, or you don't like to use an ultrasound when you're doing your central lines. As you're going in with the needle, you, you can hook this up to your needle, it measures the pressure. So if you hit the artery before you wind up causing any problems and putting you know, a, um, a seven French A-line into somebody, some clavian or, or carotid, uh, this will tell you what the pressure is there. Uh, so it, you, you know you're in the, in the wrong spot. If you're doing a spinal tap, you can use this, um, and as you're going in, it'll measure your um, uh, spinal pressure. So you don't have to take that manometer and uh, try and get it leveled just right, and the patient's crying in pain and stuff. You just, this can just go right on your needle as you're going in, <clears throat> and you'll measure your pressure right away. Um, you can use it to measure compartment pressures. Our, our hospital has one of those striker things. That if you, have some, you think somebody has an elevated um, uh, pressure in one of the compartments, you, you hook this up, and you're supposed to stick it in there. Um, <clears throat> We can never find it. Whenever we've looked for it, we, we call, and the OR says the ICU has it. The ICU says the ER has it. We say we don't have it. It's probably in dietary somewhere. <clears throat> so it's totally useless for us. But this device will measure that pressure. So all you do is you, you put a, a, a syringe on it, put some water in it, needle on the end of it, stick it in whatever you want to measure the pressure on. It'll measure your, your, your compartment pressure. So it's really nice <clears throat> in that respect. Off-label use of it, and we've been, we've been looking at this, is you can also measure an A-line with it. So if you're in a, in a department where if you want to put an A-line in somebody, an arterial catheter in somebody, it's going to be a 30-minute ordeal where everybody has to pull out the manual and figure out how to hook this thing up, and you know, they hook it up wrong, and it, it never really, it takes, by the time you get it all hooked up, the patient's already going to the ICU. This is awesome. You, you basically just put your A-line in, but artery, um, Either the radial artery or the vein or the or the ephemeral artery, screw this thing on. It just it, this little thing. It just screws on to the end of it, and you've got a, it, it measures the map. It doesn't give you a systolic diastolic, but it'll give you the map on your arterial pressures. Now it's not approved for that, but we've compared it to the A lines, and the map matches out um, really, really well. You got to get a little bit used to it because it measures um, three times a second, so you'll see it going up and down a lot. Like the, the map will change real quickly. It'll go up five, down five, up five, down five, because it's measuring it so quickly. But it, um, it does a really, really nice job, and it's something to have in there. The really nice thing about it is it costs $55. So it's worth having a stack of these in your department for just those instances. Uh, I think that the most we use it for is the A-lines, <coughs> and occasionally for the, um, uh, the compartment pressures, and we're worried about somebody on. So it's, it's actually a very, very nice thing. Dermaclips. There's two things here on... Um, non-suture wound closures. And the, the first is the dermaclip, which looks like, and that's, that's the first picture there, and you basically, it looks like those wire ties you use around a computer. Um, you you kind of tie one end, you tie the other end, and then you pull these things and they click, 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 and it pulls the wound together. Um, so it's, it's pretty cool. I mean, you're obviously going to use it on smaller wounds, but it looks pretty cool. The other looks a little more barbaric. Um, there, it's, uh, you take and you, kind of jab these hooks into somebody's skin and then pull it over and then jab the hooks in the other side. Uh, I don't know that I'd be real comfortable if somebody came towards me with that. Um, 
The other ones look like they work just fine. Both of these are pretty neat, but to be honest with you, in the type of wounds they're being used on, they're the type of wound that we probably would just get the, uh, the stapler and just put a, like three staples in and be done with it. Um, but if, if, you know, if you don't want to use the stapler, they're, um, they're out there and they're, they're both used, but they're going to be for small wounds. You're not going to you know, put a dog bite together with either of these things. This uh, vent train is really, really neat. Um, <clears throat> How many have ever had to do transtracheal ventilation on somebody? You've got a, a, an upper airway tumor, a ball stuck in the back of some kid's throat where you basically wind up taking just puncturing the trachea and uh, oxygenating them through that. If you've ever done that, number one, I strongly, strongly, strongly recommend that you, you buy um, Cook uh, Critical Care, the, the company Cook, they make all these catheters and stuff, has a transtracheal catheter. Just buy it. Don't try and reinvent it. Don't try and put a 14 gauge catheter in there. Just buy this thing. It's this coiled uh, catheter that, so it doesn't get collapsed down. All you do is it's just a, it looks like a giant IV needle. You just stick it in the trachea and you're fine. Problem with it is you can put oxygen in, and it's got a, an adapter that hooks up to the wall so you can put the oxygen in. You can't exhale through it real well. It's easy enough to forcefully to put oxygen in, but it takes a long time to get the, the, the gas back out. So you wind up oxygenating somebody while you're doing a formal uh, crike or something like that on them, buying yourself some time to pull the, whatever the foreign body is in their airway out. But you can't ventilate them, so the CO2 just climbs and climbs and climbs. This isn't necessarily a bad thing. What this device does, and what's really cool about it is, it hooks up to your transtracheal ventilator. It's like whatever, whether if you use the 14 gauge catheter, fine. If you use the, the Coke device, that's fine. But when you push the button, it pushes the oxygen in. When you flip the button the other way, when you pu push the button the other way, it diverts the oxygen stream across the top of the catheter. And as it goes across the top of the catheter, there's a, a uh, Bernoulli effect. As, and so it lowers the pressure and it sucks the gas back out of their lungs. So you actually can ventilate a patient through this. And if you can never get the t them intubated, you can actually ventilate them for hours with this device. So it's, it's not, whereas a transtracheal uh, ventilator or jet set up, you can only do it for a short period of time until you, you solve the problem of getting a formal airway in them. This, you can keep them actually oxygenated and ventilated. So it's a very, very cool device. It's, it's, and the, the, the physics behind it is, is pretty simple, um, but it, it is actually uh, worthwhile taking a look at it and make sure you can get it in, in your department. And it's relatively inexpensive. Uh, the cost, they, we, the, we got all these things and, um, uh, Rick Bucott and I walked around and, and found all these things. Uh, it's only going to be like you know, 40, 50 bucks. Uh, so it's one of those things that it goes into your difficult airway cart and you keep it there. But it, it is really nice because if you've ever had that person who's hypoxic and you're trying to do this crash crico on them, this will buy you all the time you need to do a really nice formal um, you know, surgical airway on them. And all it, all it leaves is a little hole in the trachea like that. The aortic compliance measurement. I like this. I like this a lot. I, I saw this uh, at ASEP. Um, that's actually, that picture is mine. I'm very proud to have a 7.9, whatever an M over S is. Um, what this device does is you, you, you measure the height of the person. There's a little, you stand on this scale type thing uh, in your bare feet. And then there's a, a, a little uh, scale type thing that measures how high your manubrium is off, off of this and you plug that number into the, the computer, and then you hit the button and it whirls and, and gives you a number. And what it measures is the pulse wave velocity from a contraction of your heart to how long it takes the blood to flow through your aorta. And it only measures your height because it has to know roughly how, how far along your aorta is. And the compliance of, your, of your, your aorta determines how fast the pulse wave flows. The compliance of your aorta is determined by how stiff it is, which is a reflection of how much atherosclerosis you have. So if you stand on there, and it takes a long time for the pulse wave to get from the heart to your feet, um, then you've got a lot of atherosclerosis in your vessels, and you can then use that and to predict your risk of a, um, a myocardial problem. So if you look at the, the second picture there, on to the right is the um, uh, major cardiovascular event probability. Okay, wait, 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 don't get ahead. Damn anxious kids. Um, 
if, if you look to the right, it'll, it'll tell you, like, if you're less than 7.7, .7, you have a 1.5% chance of having a major cardiovascular event in the next five years. So they, they've got probability tables associated with it. It's not, not just, oh, here's a number, you know, go and live with it. Um, I'm 7.9, so I guess I'm a little over 1.5. Um, if, you're four, if you're 10, you're 4%, and then if you're greater than 11, um, you should really uh, go and get a cast done. Uh, so that's 13%. So I, I stood on there and I thought this was, this was really cool. And Rick was uh, with me, Rick Bucata, who's written a lot of these chapters. He's going, like, I don't know, this, this looks like another gimmick. And this guy comes up and he gets on it. And so we're watching him, he gets on. And um, the, the guy looks at it and, and his thing comes back 13. And uh, the, the guy who's running it says, you know, um, you really should go and see your doc when you get home. He goes, eh, I don't need to. He goes, I've got four stents already. I just want to see how accurate this thing was. So it's actually pretty cool. So, you know, I, um, the question is, how would I see this in the emergency department? Oh, I would see this as being awesome. And, and I would also see it in the primary care office as being awesome. So you have somebody who comes in with chest pain. And it's like, oh, what am I going to do? I get a set of um, uh, enzymes, and my enzymes are negative. Okay, so I've risk stratified you, but they're not perfect. If I stick you on this device, I now have another predictor of your risk, it's another risk stratifier. So I can risk stratify you with your enzymes, I can risk stratify you now with a, um, a reflection of what's going on in your coronary arteries. It's, it takes six seconds to do. I would, I, well, they, let's put, uh, a lot of these things aren't um, commercially available yet. They'll be coming, though they will be out within the year 2018. So this will be out. Um, but yeah, I would absolutely do it. You know, if you look, so I went back and I did, I looked at some of the literature on it because um, I, I was like still a little suspicious. The, the physiology behind this uh, is really awesome. Um, and th th this is not one of these fly by night things. There's a lot of, of um, science behind this. So yeah, I would absolutely document it. All right, you could dish, you, right, but you would do it, this, it's, it's over the next five years, number one. Number two, um, what you're documenting them for is close follow-up. But you can sit down with your cardiologist and say, gee, if we get somebody who's over 10, should we take them, you guys want to take and stress them, cath lab, whichever you want. So, yeah, you're, you're, it just gives you another p point to, to discuss how you're going to go with this individual. I, I think if, if you've got somebody who's under 7 and their troponins are negative, they're concordant. If you get discordant stuff, their um, troponins are negative but this is high, but then you talk with the, the cardiologist and stuff about it. Yeah, they calcium CT scores and or CTA and all those things. Yeah, they're, they're, everything you know adds up. Uh, this I think is totally ludicrous, but we had to put it in there anyway. This is the portable device for stroke detection in the field. All right. So what you do is you go to the nursing home where they say someone's not acting right. Um, it, nobody looked at them for four days, but now they notice that they're not acting right, and they're going to send them to you because they think they might have a stroke. <clears throat> but the nursing home is equally distant between the comprehensive stroke center and a community hospital. So they have to descend, decide which way they're going to send them. So the paramedics show up, and they slap this on the 80-year-old guy's head, um, and then this is supposed to look at conduction on both hemispheres of the brain and tell you whether or not the person is having a stroke. Now, these things, you see those little knobs? You have to stick your thumb on them and stick a little needle into everybody's head. So I'm sure people are going to cooperate with this very well in the field. Um, and it actually hooks up to a physio control pack. And it, you know, beeps and buzzes. And it tells you, oh, there's more conduction on one side versus the other side. So they're having a stroke. Take them to the, the stroke center. Uh, <clears throat> I have no faith that this is ever going to make it outside of this model's head. Um, but it, it is something that I will say, inevitably, it will show up somewhere. And if those of you who are involved with EMS, the, I'm sure the paramedics are going to come to you and say, we need one of these things. This, this goes right into that field of putting the CAT scanner in the ambulance and taking it to the patient. How many have one of those in their neighborhood? Yeah, they're, they're in Trenton, up, up the, the road from us, they, the stroke center put a CAT scanner in the back of an ambulance. And when they have a potential stroke, they drive the CAT scanner to the site, and they do a CAT scan on the person in the field, which is then interpreted by a neurologist remotely 
who tells them to give the patient TPA or not? Yes, that's a, um, uh, I don't think it's made much of a difference. The time to TPA is going down, I'm sure. Um, how, would you like to, how would you like to get loaded with a TPA and then on the way to the hospital get hit by a car? I am sure that's going to, you better be going to the trauma center as well as the stroke center. Uh, another pre-hospital device, this is very cool. It, it, and I, I'm surprised it took so long for them to come up with this. This is the rapid infusion in the field. It looks like something your kids would play with on a hot afternoon uh, with a, um, a water gun. Uh, and it basically is exactly what it is. It is a water pistol. Uh, but it's designed to rapidly infuse uh, um, uh, fluids into somebody in the field. So whereas we have the rapid infusers in the emergency department, the, the, the level ones and those kind of things, they can put fluid in right away. They don't have them in the ambulance. The best they can do is blow up a, an ambu bag around something. This thing can put a liter of fluid into somebody in less than five minutes through a 20-gauge IV. I, I actually want these for the department because you, know, the, the, you get somebody who's a bad GI bleed and, and you, you, you know, you're, you're telling the team, let's get some IVs in them while you're, you're, you're doing your assessment. You look up and somebody put a 22-gauge in this giant vein in the arm. It's like, oh, man, you wasted that, arm, that vein for that? Well, this is really cool. You can literally five minutes um, pump in a liter of fluid. And I was playing with it, and it's not that bad. Your arm doesn't get tired, although you're going to make the person who put the 20-gauge IV in there use it. Um, but it is actually pretty neat. What's that? Oh, yeah. It'll work with anything. It, it, it'll work. The right. Now, you're going to have to push harder because there's more resistance in an I.O., but it'll work there. Yeah. You can put blood in it. Yeah. Yep. All right. Who here likes the I.N.D. abscesses? Anybody? There's always, yeah, see, there's always somebody here who just gets a charge out of it. Okay, this is going to um, burst your bubble, literally. Um, what this is is... Um, it's basically, they call it a quick loop. There's a number of them out on the market. And this stems from uh, the, the uh, colorectal literature, where what they found was like these perirectal or perianal abscesses. You really couldn't sometimes get up and drain the whole thing and open it up effectively. And so what they would do would be make a, two stab incisions in it and tie a, a piece of gauze or something around it and just let the thing ooze out over a period of time. What this device is is, Similar to that, it's not gauze, though. It's more of a, um, a plastic-type thing. So you take the abscess, you puncture one end of it, put a hemostat through, tent the other side of the abscess, puncture that, push the hemostat out, grab this device, and pull it through. So now you have two, two puncture wounds through the skin and this loop of material of this plastic kind. It's like a rubber band. Think of it as a rubber band going through the... Um, uh, the, the abscess itself, then you, you, you anchor it down to the skin and you know, put some gauze on it and just over time let it just drain out. The abscess just drains out through it. And then ultimately, once it stops draining, you clip this and pull it out. And they instruct the patients. You actually just clip it and put, the patients actually pull the thing out. So it is, it is pretty nice in that respect. Um, I think it works well in those, those kind of water balloon looking abscesses it's not going to work well in that kind of mishmash of multiple tiny little bubble-like abscesses that you have uh, with some of these MRSA infections. But I think your garden variety, you know, bubble-like abscess, I think it works real well. They say that it leaves less scarring and people uh, like it a lot better. Uh, the infection source identification system, these bio, bio fire systems, um, are actually, this is actually really cool. This is the next generation of blood cultures. Uh, and this is just an early version of it. They have respiratory secretion, stool specimens, CSF. And what they are are um, really fast preliminary, polymerase chain reaction chambers. And you take your sample, whether it's a nasal swab or whatnot, put it in there. And in an hour, it will run through a polymerase chain reaction with all the, the, um, uh, the multipliers for the various pathogens you might be suspecting. So if there's um, a respiratory one, there's like 30 possible respiratory pathogens you're looking at. They've got the amplifiers for all 30 of them in this uh, reaction chamber. And if any of them are present, it will grow out that RNA, and then you'll, you'll pick it up in your detectors. And then they can tell you back right away, within an hour, what's going on. Whether you have RSV, whether you have influenza, what subtype of influenza you have, whether you have eight Hemophilus influenza, whatever's going on there. Uh, so if you're somebody who really needs to know right away, you know, so say you've got an oncology patient or something like that, it, it would be worthwhile knowing. 
some of our patients, um, you know, for um, they come in, they've had diarrhea for an extended period of time. You really want to know whether you want to start them on antibiotics or not because you're afraid they may have a bacterial infection. This would help you there. The one area that I ask them about and the one I really want to know about is, would he, you know, can I do this with the, the febrile child? Because that's the one that we're always worried about. You know, can I, can I put some blood in there? And they said, no, not yet. They, they haven't gotten that. They expect another year or two to be able to do that. I can also do CSF. So if you really want to know, you, know, you, you, you do the LP, you've got 400 white cells. Is it bacterial? Is it viral? Do I keep you in the hospital? Can I send you home? Uh, this would be something that could be used for that. Uh, some of the labs are using it. Anybody have it in their lab? No. All right, uh, the Butterfly IQ ultrasound. This is very cool. If you like ultrasounds, this is really, really a neat little device. It's an ultrasound that hooks up to your phone. It, it, you plug it into your phone, and it is an ultrasound, and it gives you a gorgeous image, an absolutely gorgeous image. Uh, it's about $2,000. You have to, if you sign up now for it, it's like a, a Tesla car. You, there's like a, a waiting period to get it because everybody wants one of these things. I don't know that I would put it on my iPhone. Because um, I, I don't want to go over and like, look for an app, look and see if somebody has an abscess or not, an IND, an abscess, or, or do a paracentesis using this thing. I'd, I'd borrow somebody else's phone to do it. Um, but <clears throat> uh, I, where I think it will be of value is just buy yourself an iPad and you know, put it on a, on a tray in the emergency department and hook this thing up to it and go around and, and you can use it there. Um, the, we have the GE ultrasound system. That's about $30,000. And it's basically the size of an, it's basically an iPad on a stand. Um, and we have to change probes and stuff. This thing does from 14 megahertz down to 4 megahertz. You can use it for whatever you want, paracentesis, putting IVs in, whatever. It's actually really, really cool. And that's something I would clearly think about getting for the department. If, I mean, if you want it for yourself, that's, that's great. Um, then every relative you know is going to come over to your house to have you scan their baby three times a week. Uh, um, you can record it on your phone and then uh, offload it to whatever you want to offload it to. Yeah, no, there, that's even better. Um, although I don't know that you can, sec you have to figure out how to securely send it up there. You have to send it up there without their name on it, uh, with, with the way you have to do it. This thing is, uh, this Macy catheter is actually pretty cool. It basically looks like a, a, um, a Foley catheter, uh, only you put it in the rectum. Um, there have been occasions, I guess, when people have put the, um, uh, a Foley catheter in the wrong hole. Um, uh, but uh, this one you put in there and you could administer medicines through it. So it's not used to drain things. It's used to, the, the tip of it is adjusted so you could hook a syringe up to it and inject medicines into it. Um, the reason that I think it's really worthwhile is when you have the person whose ammonia level is 107 and obviously, they're not going to drink the lactulose. You don't want to put an NG tube down them because they've got large varices. So you slip this into the rectum. You can inject the lactulose in there. And I think it's going to be a great use to, to, to be put in there. Um, the final thing I will read. Um, this is, is a really interesting device. This is the upper extremity diagnostic and therapeutic device. It's called the hand. It is both a diagnostic and therapeutic device that has been around for a long time but has fallen out of favor with the introduction of some of the above items. The hand can be used to identify fevers, to palpate for masses or areas of tenderness, to assess skin tone or the nature of rashes, and to identify nuchal rigidity, and even to estimate intraocular pressure. Therapeutically, it can reduce dislocation, dislocations or hernias, align fractures, and even correct testicular torsion. It looks really versatile. Um, the standard hand comes prepared to be used with any number of sterile or non-sterile covers, which I'm sure you have in your department, and, no modifications, uh, and, and with no modifications can attach to almost all medical instruments used in the ED. It comes as a package of two. Um, saw a lot of them at the uh, expo, so. All right. Uh, I, I really like this talk because there's always something new out there. And one of the things I, I love is, is nobody, everybody likes to put off um, salesmen and detail men. And, oh, we want to come and talk to you. No, 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 no. But there's really good stuff out there. And none of this stuff in here is, is developed by any major you know, big corporation or anything else. These are all individuals who put together, uh, you know, crowdsourced a, 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 a program and came up with these devices. And the reason they came up with them was these were practicing docs or practicing nurses or clinicians who said, there is a need for this, and I'm going to solve this problem, which you don't get from obviously from people who create EMRs and those kind of things. 
Uh, so these are really directed towards what we do in our practices. And I, I can see a lot of these having a lot of applicability in, in the practice setting. So um, questions, thoughts, any, I, like something's really, that was really stupid, why'd you put it in there? No? Yeah. Go ahead. There it actually is. I didn't put it in there. There is a disimpactor out there that I would not want to use. It's a, in the hardware store, no, in the hardware store, you ever see that thing? It's like a, it's like a, a ribbon, a, a stiff ribbon. It's got these spikes on it that you can put, snake down your drain and pull out, like, you know, clogs and stuff like that. That, yeah, that's exactly what it is. <laughs> you stick that in the needle in the eye. Yeah, the, this, this gentleman points out the point. He said, "Oh, you don't have to measure the intraocular pressure with your finger. Just take the manometer and stick it in their eye." Yeah. That will work. I, I, my eye was bothering me the other day, so I said to one of the, the docs, "You know, I said, can, can you just measure the pressure? I'm old enough to have in, you know glaucoma and stuff." And we have a garden variety ancient. It's not ancient. It's actually a new device, but it's been around forever. Shiatsu tenimer, that metal thing where the thing swings back and forth, because we just don't believe in that the tono pen. And she used it on me, and it worked beautifully. Absolutely, absolutely beautifully, yeah. So it, um, yeah, not everything that's new is good. <laughs>